I'm Julia McFarlane, co-host of the One Decision podcast. We're coming up on a significant milestone. It's our one year anniversary of bringing you in-depth analysis of the critical decisions shaping our world. To celebrate the occasion, co-host and former head of MI6, Sir Richard Dearlove, and myself, will answer questions submitted by you, the listeners. Spies are usually pretty tight-lipped, so don't miss the chance to write in. Your question might even make it onto the podcast. For more information, head over to onedecisionpodcast.com. You're listening to a special episode of One Decision, brought to you from New York. The United Nations General Assembly brought the world's leaders to town, just as Vladimir Putin announced a partial mobilization of forces to join his war in Ukraine. The news took the global community somewhat by surprise. The Russians have been pushed back in key parts of Ukraine in the last month, but opening up more Russian citizens to the war effort is likely to be costly for Putin, both politically and economically. Some signs of that began to emerge as reports of flights leaving Russia for its nearest visa-free neighbours began selling out, and social media became awash with rumours and claims that Russian men were fleeing the country by any means possible. Some claimed that the queues to leave Russia by its long border with Finland were exaggerated, according to the Finnish border guard, though they now admit there are plenty of Russians trying to leave. Prime Minister Sanna Marin has announced that Finland is now to ban Russian tourists from entering the country in the next few days, following similar moves by other EU nations bordering Russia. Finland has a long history with Russia, and memories of the Winter War in 1939 have shaped Finland's defence policy ever since. We got an update on the situation on the border and Finland's growing concerns about Russia from their ambassador to the UN, Ambassador Alina Kalku. Obviously, you and Russia have a long history. It goes back quite a long time. I found it very, very interesting a few months ago at the NATO conference, speaking to your foreign minister, uh, Minister Havisto, he explained that you have a long working relationship with Russia as neighbours and that when Finland made the historic announcement that it would seek a session to NATO, your president phoned up Putin to give him the heads up that that's what Finland was going to do and that he had quite a pleasant conversation conversation with Vladimir Putin. So firstly, what is the reaction to Vladimir Putin's announcement that he was announcing a partial mobilization of forces to deploy to Ukraine? Well, we think it's a wrong decision, uh, definitely. Um, there's a, a danger for escalation. Uh, it is obviously uh, done because he's not doing too well with his war efforts. Um, the Ukrainians have been bravely defending their country and also retaking some of the territory. Uh, so the reason for this um, uh, mobilization must be his uh, plan to do better in the war. He's initiated himself. Uh, we think it's a wrong decision. Um, we think um, the attack was a wrong decision. Uh, we condemn it. Um, it is uh, amazing to see uh, in 2022, that there is actually a, a major country, uh, a developed country, with a population which is well educated, which has great prospects for their future, go into a war, attack a neighbor to grab territory and annex territory. So whatever has happened since the beginning of this year is is a disaster, um, and and we do hope that um, that uh, Mr. Putin would uh, understand that this is the wrong path he's following and, uh, and uh, the war would stop and uh, the sovereignty of Ukraine and the territorial integrity of Ukraine would be, would be um, uh, the territories lost would be definitely returned to, to Ukraine. It's admirable how they've been defending themselves. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the situation with the border and, and the reports that have been uh, of the situation with the traffic of Russians 
going into into Finland and crossing the border. Now, there has been some confusion as to what the accuracy of those reports are, but what we do know is that there have been flights leaving Russia, uh, selling out, that there are Russians trying to leave from a number of different entry points. Your Prime Minister, Sanna Marin, that the situation vis-a-vis uh, Russian uh, travel and tourism into Finland needs to be reassessed after Putin's announcement of the mobilisation. And she said that Finland does not want to be a transit country. What can you tell us about the true figures of the numbers of Russians coming into Finland? Is there a lot of people flowing over the border? Are you expecting more Russians to try to leave and enter through Finland? Well, overall, uh, it's it's a long border. We've had um, over 10 crossings um, in, in the past. Um, there's been over 10, well over 10 million uh, border crossings uh, across that border, and that this was before COVID-19 mm-hmm. hit everybody. Um, then COVID-19, of course, cut off the traffic uh, simply because of, of the re- health restrictions, uh, also on, on, on the Russian side. Um, we've had uh, a growing number of uh, uh, crossings uh, since the COVID restrictions were, were cut off. And, um, and uh, part of that is tourism from Russia, mm. uh, tourists coming. Um, I think uh, also in the public opinion, uh, people have felt it uncomfortable that a country that is attacking uh, and, and the war goes on in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, at the same time, um, people from Russia um, travel back and forth to, to Europe for tourism. And, um, and since we have the land border, obviously, uh, we are one of the, one of the crossings where, where the Russians can, uh, can cross the, the, the land frontier. Uh, flights we don't have um, anymore from, from Russia or, or into Russia. There's been um, a flow of some thousands uh, people coming over, and uh, the first information our uh, border guard gave was that uh, since the mobilization announcement, uh, there was no immediate increase. But actually, there is now uh, an increase in in the crossings. Uh, But the numbers are not huge in comparison with with the past. I think we've had... uh, uh, less than 2,000 people more coming uh, into Finland uh, in, in, in the past day. That's interesting. And, and d- Russians don't need a visa? to. They to need a visa. They do need yeah. a visa. They do need a visa, and, uh, and we are part of the Schengen area. Mm. Um, so there's many Russians who actually uh, pass Finland to, mm. to get into different European destinations. And that's why we, we see it would be extremely important that the EU and the Schengen area, Schengen members of the, of the European Union would have a, a, an agreed policy and uh, mechanism on how to deal with this situation. Right, right. So the, the, the changing of opinion that has been articulated about looking again at Russian visas, uh, your prime minister has mentioned it, your foreign minister has mentioned it, uh, the reports that Finland is preparing to block Russian tourism. How are you able to unilaterally uh, n- uh, refuse to grant visas to Russian tourists? Or do you need the EU to get involved in that? Or can you take steps on your own unilaterally? Well, we already took the step that the, uh, the, uh, no, the, the amount of the, the volume of visas was cut off into 10% mm-hmm. uh, in the beginning of September. So the numbers were cut short uh, mm. when it comes to tourists. Of course, there's other people who can cross. Uh, many have family ties across the border. Um, many uh, work on either side of the border. So there's um, a certain number of individuals that will continue crossing the border also. Uh-huh. So we, we're looking at the tourists, which right. can be a huge number of people, of right. course, uh, in, in, in principle. Um, and, um, and we cut that into 10% uh, of, of the, the amount of tourist visas that, that were granted before. Okay. And now, uh, now we're looking at uh, different options. Uh, we're also looking at this from the legal point of view. On, on cutting off tourism altogether, and uh, mm. it it can be done in various ways, but mm. uh, but it needs to be prepared well. So you're you're looking at the legal ways of doing that without getting the EU involved and the amount of time that well, that would we, take. Well, we look of course also at the EU options, but uh, but we also look at, uh, at at national options. Okay, that's really interesting. I want to ask 
ask you to consider that. Do you agree in principle that given uh, Putin is, is, is waging his war in Ukraine, it is one that not necessarily the public, he has the public support with, the fact that he announced this mobilization and immediately thousands of Russians made efforts to try and leave the country. Is that a good idea? Should we stop Russians who want want to abandon Putin's war effort, who want to leave the country? Do you think it's a good idea for us to not aid them in that effort and not to let them out of their country? Well, I think it's, it's a fair question to ask. Uh, but we will, of course, keep the asylum. We deal with asylum uh, seekers uh, in the normal way. Mm. Um, so if there's people uh, in, in need of asylum, that is, uh, that is, of course, going to be there also in the future. Um, uh, but uh, for the rest, uh, the options are being looked at right now. So we're still working on, on, on what to do and how to do it. Uh, so I don't have an immediate answer sure. what will be the outcome because this is under under discussion in Helsinki. Interesting. So to the Russians who would maybe describe themselves as conscientious objectors who don't want any part in Putin's war, who maybe want to leave, you would you would advise them to, to, to claim asylum as a way of leaving Russia? Well, uh, we don't advise uh, people who want to leave their country, um, but... Uh, but we, that's a possible route. We, we, we deal with the individuals who come on an mm. individual basis. Got it. Finland has quite an interesting relationship with Russia. Obviously, there was the Winter War uh, in the early 20th century. Relations have changed a lot from that, but Finland has often been accused of being soft on Russia. Obviously, you have a very pragmatic need to cooperate with Russia and to maintain good relations. And earlier this year, during the build-up of Russian forces on the border with Ukraine, when there was speculation that they may go into Ukraine, there were Finnish ministers speaking to the media saying that they weren't worried about any kind of incursion. They weren't worried about Finland's security when it came to Russian aggression. But the decision to launch an invasion into Ukraine changed all of that. And as a result, Finland and Sweden decided to change their historic policy of neutrality and apply for membership to NATO. Have you seen any retaliation for that decision so far? And has there been a need to reassess the potential threat to your country from Russian invasion, given what you say, it's amazing in this day and age that a developed country, as you say, could go so far as invading its neighbor and trying to take sovereign territory by force. I think the statements that you heard after the uh, attack and also uh, the statements that you're hearing today uh, have to do uh, with the situation close to our borders. So we don't feel any immediate military threat at the moment. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, the attack to Ukraine happened, um, uh, people watched TV in Finland, they read newspapers, uh, followed social media, of course, and, and saw what was going on. And there, the population started to support NATO membership in big numbers. Uh, we went all, well over 70% in the polls. Um, and I think it shows people were worried about the future of, of Finland uh, and people wanted to have a security guarantee and be part of a defense alliance. Um, um, I don't think at any point uh, in this year there's been an immediate threat at our borders. Um, we have been um, sometimes um, said to be soft uh, with Russia. I think with the Soviet Union, you have to remember what kind of a world it was. Um, Finland wanted and, and kept its democracy intact even uh, throughout the Second World War. Uh, we were a market open society, market economy. Our geographic position was complicated. There's no question about it. On the other hand, um, uh, we kept uh, throughout the Cold War years, but also uh, since the Cold War, we kept uh, our defense uh, capabilities in good shape. Mm. Uh, we have a conscription army, so uh, basically all male population and, uh, and voluntary females uh, can join the army uh, and have military training. 
Um, we have kept a large land army. Uh, we have um, we have taken good care of our defense capabilities throughout the years when others didn't consider that important. Mm. Um, there's also another aspect in it. Um, we have always been prepared for um, for um, a crisis situation. If you look at the map, Finland is uh, having a long border over 1,300 kilometers border uh, with Russia. Uh, we had that border with the Soviet Union, um, and um, and uh, we are surrounded by sea. So we have also always had to think through how the, uh, the emergency supplies would work if Finland would be cut off from um, from uh, transports to, to Europe. Um, so we have a very extensive emergency supply system. We store lots of uh, foodstuffs, lots of energy mm. uh, to be able to be resilient even in the time of, of crisis. And this we've kept uh, throughout these years. So we've always known what the risks might be. And I think uh, that has been a very responsible way to handle uh, the situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the Finnish population, the people. Right, that's so fascinating to hear. What what a comprehensive sort of level of preparedness that your country has been carrying out, incredibly diligent, um, not the same case uh, for many other countries in the EU, I think it's fair to say. I know you are the ambassador to the UN, but may I ask you a question about NATO? How is the, the NATO accession going? How is the process going? And your foreign minister uh, this week said that uh, Hungary, which there had been a lot of questions of, had indicated that it was open to signing the protocols and, and, and paving the way. But however, uh, Turkey and, and President Erdogan has, has repeatedly said he reserves the right to veto Finland joining NATO and still the question of those extradition requests from from Turkey but how, how is the process going so far in terms of joining well NATO? the process have gone fast if if we count the ratifications I mean there's 27 of them at the moment uh, we have had uh, discussions with Turkey um, uh, we have explained our policies and our legislation to Turkey and we contact uh, the contacts um, and we certainly hope that uh, that um, yeah, that Turkey will proceed with with the ratification. President Erdogan has uh, also said that it is, of course, the Parliament of Turkey that will deal with the ratification. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, Finland has taken uh, actions uh, to sanction. Uh, an oligarch close to Putin called Boris Rotenberg. Uh, there's also another Russian oligarch who has Finnish nationality. He's called Gennady Timchenko, and he's described as, I think, the sixth richest uh, Russian oligarch and a very, very close member of Putin's inner circle. He still enjoys Finnish citizenship. He has not yet been sanctioned. Do you think it's time for Finland to take a stronger uh, stance on members of Putin's uh, crony regime who have Finnish citizenship? Uh, well, first of all, I, I'm not quite sure where this being soft on Russia comes from, really, because we've been part of the sanctions all the time. Uh, and um, we've always been uh, straightforward when, when it comes to the discussions. We always say what we think and uh, listen to what they have to say. Uh, so I don't quite recognize the softness, actually. Um, we have, of course, lots of uh, practical issues issues to handle, uh, simply because of the long border and, and, and the neighbor, uh, the, the, the neighborly uh, links. Uh, but uh, but the softness, I, I don't quite I don't quite rec recognize. Uh, we're not dealing here in New York uh, with um, the sanctioned individuals. So mm. this question you would need to ask from my colleagues in Helsinki. Mm, but personally, do you think maybe Finland should take action against members of Putin's inner circle who have Finnish citizenship? Well, we are uh, we are part of the EU sanctions policy. So within the EU, we also negotiate always uh, on, on the sanction list. So, so we're part of that discussion always. Mm. Very, very diplomatic answer. Um, do you think a permanent member of the Security Council should be allowed to keep its position if it continues to flagrantly violate the principles of the UN Charter? Well, we have been uh, thinking about Security Council reform uh, for a very long time, uh, and it has been certainly on the agenda of the UN for a very long time. 
Uh, we feel there's a need to reform uh, the council, and we would be very ready to expand uh, the membership. Um, also expand the membership uh, when it comes to the permanent members, however, without more veto rights. Mm. We've seen what kind of problems we have with veto rights in the Council. So we'd prefer uh, expansion without veto rights. I think the UN Security Council and, and the membership should work uh, and, and make sure that, that this um, war ends that uh, Russia uh, follows uh, the rules of the, of, of the international law. Um, there was a precedent uh, for, um, uh, for a United Nations, which was the League of Nations. Mm. And um, it was uh, at the time when uh, the Soviet Union attacked Finland. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, the Soviet Union was expelled. It left. Uh, there was a decision to expel uh, the Soviet Union from League of Nations, um, and uh, the League of Nations didn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, but the UN is a successor to the League of Nations, right? Uh, UN is is um, is much larger, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. In in modern times, much more uh, extensive when it comes to its work around the world. I mean, UN is present almost everywhere. It has a huge machinery to, to support humanitarian needs, to support developmental needs, uh, to tackle different uh, crisis situations. Um, um, I, I wouldn't be worried that the UN would fail uh, uh, in, in many of the areas which uh, it is um, uh, where, where it's operating, but it definitely uh, would need to be successful in, in the major um, issue it is created for. That's it for this special episode of One Decision from New York and the 77th UN General Assembly. If you're enjoying our podcasts, we would love it if you could spread the word. Maybe leave us a positive review. We drop new episodes exploring geopolitics and national security every Thursday with analysis from my co-host, Sir Richard Dearlove, the former chief of MI6. From me and the team, thanks for listening and see you next time. <laughs>